Hi, I'm John and I am the Astronomy Assistant here at the Observatory Science Centre and now we are in Dome A and this is the home of the Thomson 30-inch Reflecting Telescope. Okay, now this telescope is very different to the one you may have at home or one you've seen before. For example, the finder scope is on the bottom and this telescope is very special indeed. Now most people don't notice this small telescope but actually on the 2nd of September 1859 there was a huge explosion on the Sun it was called the Carrington event two people saw this Hodgson and Carrington and this is the very telescope that Hodgson used but the real star of this room is the huge 30 inch now unlike your telescope at home the eyepiece is not attached to the telescope it's on this tower And as you can see, there's the eyepiece right here. And this is all done with mirrors. We don't have eyepieces. That eyepiece there, when I call it an eyepiece, is a hole looking at a mirror. It's crazy, isn't it? That's really, really cool. Now, all telescopes have what's known as a focal ratio. And that is the number of times the big bit, which is your main object lens, in this case, this mirror, 30 inches across, goes into the length or the focal length of your telescope. F1 would be a little tiny short telescope. You look through it, you can see a big area of field of view. F47, which is what this is, tiny field of view. You look through that, you see a much smaller area, but there's a very good reason why this was done. So F47, as you now know, we get a tiny field of view. And the reason being is with this telescope, all we wanted was the light of single stars. You're not gonna get galaxies through this. You can try, you're not gonna see them single starlight because this telescope is a spectrograph it photographed what stars are made from next time you look at a cd pay close attention those colored bands are the light in the room you are in being broken down for you isn't that cool so the magic of spectroscopy with the telescope is we get to see colored lines in starlight these color bands like rainbows but these bands are the important part because these are chemical elements within the star we're looking at which tell you what the star's made from Okay. okay, so we see these lines in starlight and these are chemical elements buried within the star itself that's being looked at. And these elements are actually this. Now don't be frightened of this. You've all seen it at school. It's the most beautiful and poetic thing you will ever see. It's the periodic table of elements. Hydrogen is number one, helium. You've got part of the Big Bang here and, this, and the process of stellar evolution has created many of the other elements here. The important thing is we filled in the gaps. We're good at science. Okay, so that's what the telescope was used for. It was used for telling us what stars are made from. But today, we use this telescope for looking at the stars and enjoying the night sky. Because most people, like yourself, if you haven't got out, you, you don't always get to see the night sky for beautiful telescopes like this. And it's great to see what we see. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this telescope has what's known as the focal ratio, is, is an F47. Hubble is only an F24 by comparison. This is big. This is the biggest gun in Sussex. She's huge. Now, the most common question I am asked on open evenings, how does it work? How does the light get from here to there? And like I said before, it's all done with mirrors. The light will come down the tube and hits the mirror at the base here. It then gets pushed, photons, this is, gets pushed two thirds of the way back up to the lump of metal you can just see jutting out the side there. That's where the focus is controlled from. The light is then pushed down towards the axle where we have a mirror on a very special mechanism and its movement is so perfectly tuned to never leave the mirror at the top of this tower. Wherever this telescope goes, the photons will hit that and bounce down through the eyepiece. The telescope sits between two prongs in this instance. These prongs are pointed to the pole star and as the Earth swings, we only need one motor to drive the telescope because wherever it sits, it will track the stars across that part of the sky. Very simple and very efficient at tracking starlight because we don't have to worry about driving up and down because the Earth's doing that for us. Now, the most amazing thing about all the domes here, the telescopes are inside the domes, brilliant. They can look anywhere you want because we can move the roof. That's also brilliant. But they're not attached to the buildings. They sit on concrete pillars that are driven into the bedrock with the buildings and the domes built around the telescopes. Whatever happens on this floor, the telescope is unaware of it. There's no vibration transmitted to the telescope. If you photograph through these, you are guaranteed a crisp, sharp image.
Now, as also previously mentioned, this telescope weighs six and a half tons, but it is so perfectly balanced with these counterweights, you can move it very easily just by using your own arms. It swings so efficiently in its design, and you need that to keep the balance. If you didn't have the telescope evenly balanced, you're gonna break the mirror. It'll be too top heavy or back heavy, and you're gonna break the scope. So it's like a set of scales. You've got a set of weights on one side, you've got the item on the other, and you get the balance right, and it will just hover there. And it's the same with the telescope mount. Now, this telescope made a number of really cool ex ex discoveries. There's a newspaper, an old newspaper, London Pictorial News, and there's an image picture of this telescope in that, in that newspaper where it photographed the first appearance of Halley's Comet on its return in 1909. It wasn't here till 1910, but this telescope saw it first and pictured it first. That's pretty cool. Okay, so yeah, this telescope discovered the eighth moon of Jupiter in 1908. Philibert Jacques Malotte was making a study of Jupiter 7, or looking at the moons of Jupiter through this telescope, and there in his pictures, when he studied them later, noticed this little tiny speck. He just discovered a brand new moon with this very telescope. That's pretty awesome. Now, the other thing with this telescope, which I haven't mentioned, is I've said we can see the things we can see through it, but actually what I haven't explained is how hard it is to line it up on anything. If you have a telescope of your own or, or you've borrowed one or you've seen somebody else's and you've seen them with a the finder scope, you get that finder scope on the object, you look through the eyepiece and it's there. We don't have that luxury. We've got a couple of finder scopes here, a bit hit and miss. There's no computer. The most technical thing in this room right now is the camera I'm talking to. So to give you an example of, of how this, how powerful this telescope can be. The Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, and the constellation of Taurus, you should be able to see it around about September time. It's coming up on the horizon. It's beautiful, beautiful seven stars. In any telescope, it will knock your socks off. It's well worth looking at. In this eyepiece, we can only see three of those stars. Now, that's pretty crazy. To get this lined up on a star like Sirius, big and bright, you can't really miss it, it's actually difficult because the field of view is so, so small that the star could be anywhere near the eyepiece and we have to hunt for it. But once it's in there, wow, it's great. Now, an astronomer I met who still works at La Palma was telling, was telling me a couple of years ago that one of the detectors on Hubble was actually used on these telescopes. That's pretty awesome. So part of this is in space and I'm well proud of her for that. Okay, so to conclude, as you know, these telescopes came here from London in the 1950s. On the 4th of December 1956, this telescope was installed in this room and it's through your support and guys like you and all of you watching this right now that we're able to keep these working for you to see them. And I realise that you know, the current things have been really difficult for everybody. It will change and when it does, you've got to come and see this telescope. It's worth every moment of your time. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ian. I am a, a volunteer at the observatory here and today I'm standing in Dome B at the observatory which is the YAP dome and the YAP reflector. Um, this is actually the biggest telescope uh, here at this site and in fact it was the biggest telescope that was in use when it was at the Royal Greenwich Observatory in Greenwich. So when this was actually built in 1932 uh, the cost of the entire dome and the telescope together was only £15,000, which you think an average London house uh, at the time was £1,000 uh, is quite a lot of money. Hard to believe, isn't it? Um, it weighs the whole thing about as much as a bus uh, and was installed in, here in sections, lowered by a crane through the roof. 
And the power of this telescope is phenomenal. It can actually capture 30,000 times more light than the human eye unaided. And this telescope was, for much of its time, was the most important and biggest telescope of the Royal Greenwich Observatory. So this is a reflecting telescope, so it uses the mirror. And the mirror, in this case, is 36 inches in diameter. Um, and it's 15 centimetres, or 6 inches thick. So imagine the weight of that mirror. Now, all the telescopes uh, of this part of the observatory in the main building are all reflecting telescopes. And they're all in the one building because that's where the machinery was for resilvering the mirror, or as, as it was in the day, illuminizing the mirror. So there's a trap door here, and when the mirror became a little bit faded and it, the, the surface had started to uh, degrade, they would winch the mirror through the floor down into um, a room below, a laboratory below, and put it into a and an illuminizing um, machine, which would actually works in a vacuum, and when the aluminum is inside it, it actually spreads out across the mirror's surface and gives it this highly reflective coating. Now, this is what they call a Cassegrain focus reflecting telescope. The light comes through the cage uh, cage-like tube there from the start and comes all the way down the tube and then reflects back up to the other mirror you see in the centre. And after the light is reflected in the secondary mirror in the centre of the cage, uh, the beam goes back down here and arrives at the eyepiece at the end. Um, and when this was actually a working telescope, there would also be a spect uh, spectroscope attached to, a spectrograph, I should say, attached to the end of the telescope. Um, and what a spectrograph does is splits the light from a star into its component colours. And the magic of a spectrograph is that it tells you huge amounts of data about the star that you wouldn't get just from looking through an eyepiece and looking at it visually. So what it does, it breaks the light down into its colours, which will tell you things like how hot the star is, it'll tell you um, how, how the star's moving, whether it's moving away from you or towards you. So the spectrograph was really important. There's some very important discoveries here at the observatory. And the most important one of those was the discovery in uh, 1972 of the optical uh, stellar mass black hole by Louise Webster and Paul Murdin. Now, this telescope was used to actually test the equipment that made that discovery. So what Paul and Louise did is they found that there was a, a star in the constellation of Cygnus that was moving in a very odd way. And they did that from using the spectrograph uh, data. So they knew that it was moving towards and away from the star in a particular kind of way, which meant that there was another very massive object in orbit with it. And it was discovered su subsequently that that very heavy object was in fact the first stellar mass black hole ever to be discovered. And it was largely discovered here by Paul Murden and Louis Webster in 1972. So like all the telescopes on this site, um, this telescope was built by Grubb and Parsons, um, who were the kind of premier telescope makers of the day back in Victorian and early 20th century eras. So um, this is a, an F-15 Cascarain reflector. It's got a focal length of uh, 4.57 metres. And as I say, it is one of the premier telescopes of the day. You'll notice that it's painted a uniform grey, more or less. And that's true of all the other telescopes, because they all, at the time this was a Royal Greenwich Observatory, um, everything was basically owned by the Admiralty. So the Admiralty was the, uh, was the organisation that owned these telescopes and the observatory. And they painted all the telescopes in the paint that they used for their warships. So if you think that these look a little bit like uh, naval artillery, that's probably why. One of the most important roles of this telescope was as a test bed for uh, equipment, uh, instruments that actually were fitted onto the 98-inch Isaac Newton telescope, which at the time was the largest telescope in Europe. And that was actually here on this site as well. So those of you who know the area will see a big dome over the trees just to the south of the equatorial group here. And that was the dome where the 98-inch Isaac Newton telescope 
resided. And it was there from 1967, and much of the equipment that it used, more the instruments to actually measure the light from stars, were actually tested, first of all, on this, the YAP reflector. Very sadly, the, uh, the old dome for the Isaac Newton telescopes were now empty, um, and the telescope was moved to La Palma in the Canary Islands in 1979. Um, you can see why they did that, um, to be honest, a place like this in the middle of Sussex at a time when astronomers were able to move, uh, travel very cheaply to places that had clearer skies, it just became less economically viable to have it here. So it just made sense to move it somewhere like the Canaries, where they were more sure of getting clear skies and dry air. So this dome, Dome B, with the YAP reflector, is open for whenever you visit the uh, observatory. Uh, but something that sadly we can't do is open it and use it for viewing. Um, it's the one telescope, really, that we can't do that with. However, we do use the, the dome as a wonderful backdrop to a number of events we do here, from musical events through to astronomy classes. You name it, it's probably happened at some point in Dome B. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed this quick tour of the dome and uh, we hope to see you very soon at the Observatory Science Centre.
I hope you've enjoyed your time with us today. It's all been a bit different for everybody this year. We wish you well, stay safe, and we really look forward to welcoming you back to the actual observatory for the 2021 Astronomy Festival. Before you go, just want to introduce a beautiful video by John Fox, which is actually showing some of the stunning night sky over the domes of our observatory. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. <laughs>